COPD. There are two types of COPD. We have <clears throat> chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So this is chronic, just like heart failure. There is no cure unless you, of course, get a lung transplant. Used to be asthma was classified as the third COPD, uh, but not anymore. Asthma is now technically under the allergic disorders. So that's why if you have asthma, you will be under the care of an allergist okay, in addition to a pulmonologist. So um, because asthma is triggered by allergies, right? So whatever you're allergic to, which causes your symptoms. So therefore, yes, you have respiratory symptoms. But however, the management is under a an allergist. Okay. Let's start with chronic bronchitis. So what's the risk factor here? Smoking. There are other risk factors. Let's say you're exposed to other pollutants, either asbestos or uh, dust, for instance, or let's say you're a miner, right? Um, any other industrial or um, other air pollutants that you're exposed to at whatever your industry is. But majority of the patients who have chronic bronchitis are smokers or at least have smoked in the past. So what happens is I'll go to the illustration right here. <clears throat> So let's talk about the structure of our airways. When we have chronic bronchitis, so this is the inflammation of the upper airways. So the large airways are inflamed chronically. So on the left is a normal bronchus. On the right is a bronchus with chronic bronchitis. Acute bronchitis is not going to look like this. Okay, acute bronchitis, yes, there will be some inflammation and narrowing. However, the symptoms go away okay, after a few days or a week. Chronic bronchitis, however, this is permanent. Patient's airway will look like that figure on the right side. Now, how did this come to be? So you look at the walls of the bronchus, of the bronchus now, this can be the main stem bronchus and as well as the right and the left main stem bronchi. So it can spread all through the upper and lower airways. Now, so we have labels there. So look at the mucous glands and then look at the thickness of the smooth muscle. So how did we get to this point? So let's start first with the risk factor. Let's say you smoke. So whenever you inhale some pollutants, let's say dust, what happens to you? Let's say you inhale, you know, fart or dust or let's say bird poop. What happens? <clears throat> what happens when you inhale them? Cough. You cough, right? So what did, why did you cough? Reaction. Okay, so that's your protective mechanism, yeah? yeah. So, and then what happens after you've coughed? What also, what do you mucus. produce? Mucus. So what? why did you produce mucus? Yeah. All right, to trap whatever the pollutants are, and then what will propel that mucus upward? So you can do this and then spit it out. What do you call them? The cilia, okay? And then we have cilia not illustrated here, but the lining of your airway here. So all around these walls here, you have cilia, right? <clears throat> and the cilia will uh, slowly propel the mucus. And then so you can expectorate it, yeah? Okay, so that's how it works. Now, imagine you being exposed to those pollutants 23, uh, not, not 23 hours, but uh, let's say, you know, 12 hours or more each day. Because let's say you're a chain smoker. So my late father was like that. So he started smoking when he was 11 years old um, until the day he died. Okay, so he, he kept smoking. So what happens? Uh, can you smoke when you're sleeping? 
you have to stop at some point, yeah? Okay. So what happens is <clears throat> we have, um, how come you and me, because we're not, we're not smokers. However, we are exposed to pollution in the city. Okay, we come to the city, we're exposed to pollution. Or in our neighborhood, because not everybody picks up um, dog poop, right? So they, they leave it, you know, and then they dry up and then they get uh, carried up in the air. So we're inhaling these things. And then we have pigeons all over the city, geese, you know, the droppings there. They also uh, get aerosolized and then we inhale them, right? So what is our protective mechanism to clean our lungs? Because we can clean you know, our, our skin, we can shower, but can, we can't really shower the airway, correct? Now, we have uh, something called uh, protease up here. So it's called protease. What is it? It's an enzyme that will break down debris. So whatever we inhale, don't worry, it, it will be broken down by protease, okay? So protease are enzymes that will destroy foreign debris, okay? So if you inhale some poop, for instance, or whatever particles enter your lungs, your airway, we have protease, okay? P-R-O-T-E-A-S-E, -E, protease. <clears throat> they will break down debris. Plus, again, we have mucus, right? So mucus will also trap the debris, and then we can expectorate them. However, once protease is produced, it will keep destroying something. They will not stop. As long as there's protease, they will destroy something. And that something could be your own airway. It, it will auto-destroy your, your lung structures. So we need another enzyme to stop. You know how our body does uh, negative um, feedback? Yeah? Okay. So once we produce protease, we also produce something called alpha-1 antitrypsin. It's mentioned here. Uh, so here, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay. We also produce that. So what will alpha-1 antitrypsin do? It will stop the production of protease. Okay. So that's as long as the balance is there, you know, we have we inhale debris. Protease and mucus is produced, and then uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin will also be produced to, to eventually stop protease, right? So as long as we have that, everything is okay. Now, let's say we start smoking. So I smoke all the time, so what will happen to my protease production? Yeah. It increases, right? Because I have debris. I constantly expose my airway to pollutants, okay? And alpha-1 antitrypsin will also be produced, yeah? Okay. Now, what happens to my mucus-producing glands? So these glands right here, what will happen to these glands? The size and number of these mucus glands if I'm a smoker? No, the size and number of the mucus glands. Increase. Increase size and the number will also increase, right? To keep up because now there's so much uh, cigarette smoke. So I have to produce a lot. Now, because their number and size increased, their activity increased, correct? So I do I produce the same mucus as a normal person or do I have more? Yeah. I have more now. Can I smoke 24 hours a day? I have to sleep at some point. Yeah, I have to stop. I have to eat. I can't like chew and smoke at the same time, right? Plus, I have to drink. So I have to stop smoking at some point. Shower right. So I can't, you know, I can't shower. I smoke in the shower. Or technically, maybe you can, right? But, <laughs> but anyway, so since you stop smoking, what happened to the mucus production and the protease production? Because your body got so used to it. And then remember, the size and number of the mucus-producing cells increased. So it's going to keep producing. It's going to continue as well as the protease will continue. So what will happen to your, your, your airway now? You have more mucus and you have more protease. And remember what did I say was protease going to do? 
they need to destroy something, right? So it's like, you know, you, you were sent there, you went to school. Well, you have to do something. I'm in school. Yeah, you have to do something. So that's what protease will do. Well, I'm here. I was sent here to destroy stuff. So I'm going to destroy something. Okay. I'm going to do some um, demo. Okay. Some demolition. But then the there's no uh, immediate response for the antitrypsin because this is now chronic. Okay. So the body got so used to, oh, there's smoke every day. But then once you stop smoking, will it stop producing? Not really. So they stay in high levels, okay? So that's the problem now. So with this chronic inflammation, chronic destruction, so that's what your airway is now going to look like, okay? Plus the um, large amount of mucus that you're going to be producing, okay? So long story short, that's what happens in chronic bronchitis. So of course, what will this patient need now? Their large airways look like this. It's inflamed, so we will give them anti-inflammatories, including steroids and nebulizers, which are bronchodilators. Okay. All right. For how long? Oh. Forever. Okay. Because this is permanent. It's not going to change. Okay. The only way is to you you need a new bronchus. Okay. So we have to do transplant. Okay. It's already damaged. It's already like that. Most people have both conditions. So emphysema is now the lower airway right here. So the, how did we get to this point? How did the air sacs become like this? Same thing as the story I told you about earlier. So the protease isn't just produced in the large airways. They reach all the way to the alveoli. So the alveoli is on the left side. There's normal alveoli there. We have 100 million of them. So tiny microscopic air sacs that inflate and deflate for gas exchange. Okay? And they are wrapped with capillaries. Right? So you have 100 million alveoli, also 100 million capillary networks. Okay? So in the lower airways, the same damage will occur. So you have increased mucus, and then you have increased protease destroying them. And once they're destroyed, they're going to look like on the right side. So those walls become flabby. So instead of individual grapes, now they become one big flabby sack that do not recoil. Okay? They, cannot, they cannot move like the individual air sacs now. So what happens to gas exchange? It's going to be very difficult because now Look at the structure. Is it, because um, the way they work is uh, our diaphragm contracts, right? And then air is sucked in passively, and then they fill the alveoli. And then the diaphragm pushes back up, and these are pushed back up, right? So then we have inhalation, and then exhalation, right? Okay, so that's how it works. Now, if these each of these uh, recoil, meaning, yeah, they can expand, but then they'll, they'll recoil, okay, then push air, push CO2 out. Since these are now like this, not individual grapes, and they recoil like no, these guys. No, no it's so, Right. So now push. it's like what happens to uh, the air that you just inhaled a while ago? Are they expelled out? No, no, they stay in here, right? So meaning you retain a lot of CO2. CO2. So that's why in fundamentals, you learn about COPD. This is why they retain a lot of CO2. CO2 technically is really residual volume, okay? Meaning it's like now, imagine this now. It's like a, going on a snorkel, okay? So who snorkels him? Okay, can you snorkel... All day, non-stop. No, no, you get tired. And you can't, you, yeah, difficult to breathe, right? Because technically, are you are you breathing back in the CO2 from the snorkel? Snorkel? Because yes, the, let's say this is the, the first time I breathe through the snorkel. I inhaled oxygen, right? But when you exhale, there's CO2 left in the, in the tube, right? And then so on your next breath, you're rebreathing the... CO2 plus new air. 
So with each succeeding breath, you are inhaling more and more CO2. So eventually, you get tired, right? You get hypoxic. So you stop. Okay, you have to stop and then take it off. Breathe normal 21% oxygen and then you can go again, right? Okay. So same thing here. So it's like breathe. It's like snorkeling forever. Okay, with these patients. It's like they're on a snorkel forever because all this residual air will be very difficult to expel. So this air, old air here, takes up a lot of space. So therefore, what happens to gas exchange? around very poor gas exchange, okay, because you have these damaged areas. So there, of course, not the entire lung will be damaged. There will be areas of healthy uh, lobes, but some one or two lobes may be badly damaged. They have the, we call these bullae now, bullae, the care one flabby um, structure there. So they're not individual grapes anymore, so incapable of gas exchange. Okay. So that's the problem here now with emphysema. Yeah. If you wear like a, a surgical mask or a mask, I mean, is that the same principle? Like if you're inhaling, you know, with the mask. Not really, because the mask, uh, I mean, there's not much space there. Oh, okay. I mean, there's, you know, air, air passes through the mask fine. Oh, okay. Maybe if you wear a... Oh, what are uh, yeah, balloon. Yeah, so that would be yeah. the same because now you have a lot of CO2 in that balloon. Okay, so what is the effect there if your lungs look like this now? So go back here in the paragraph. So there are consequences when, when this happens. So not only do you have problems with gas exchange, now you will be, so here, this can cause an increase in dead space. Okay, the dead space is like that snorkel. Okay, that snorkel uh, idea. So lung area where there, there's no gas exchange. Okay, we call that a dead space. Because yeah, there's there's space, but then no gas exchange occurs. So we call it dead space. So therefore, it's just occupying space in your lung, but not doing any gas exchange. There's no gas exchange occurring in that area. So that we call that gas space, uh, dead space. So therefore, it will impair oxygen diffusion becomes patient becomes hypoxemic okay and then later now you have cardiac problems now as a result hypoxemia here resistance to pulmonary blood flow is increased the right ventricle will have a hard time beating to pump blood into the pulmonary arteries because now you're imagine those lungs are now very flabby right so that results in pulmonary hypertension as a result the patient has right side heart failure however we don't call it right side heart failure if it's caused by copd we call it core pulmonary but on x-ray the patient with copd and patient with heart right side heart failure looks exactly the same the heart looks exactly the same. However, the difference is in the lungs because in the right side heart failure with no COPD, it, the lungs may look okay, right? But here in core pulmonale, both the lungs and the right side of the heart are pretty bad. Manifestations will be exactly the same though. So whatever you saw in right side heart failure, this is right side heart failure also, but we call it what again? Poor pulmonary because what's causing this? Is it our lung problem or a cardiac problem with core pulmonary? It's a lung problem. Okay, this is caused by pulmonary hypertension. So as a result, the high pressure in the pulmonary arteries and right ventricle lead to, uh, to backup of blood in the venous system. Now you have dependent edema, distended neck veins, and enlarged liver. Same exact symptoms in right side heart failure. No difference. But because this is caused by a lung problem, yes, we still use the same heart failure medicine, but we will have to add additional medicine now. We have to treat the pulmonary hypertension. So we have to treat the emphysema. Risk factors again, smoking, number one. Others are, of course, um, doesn't matter really what type of smoking, whether it's first-hand or second-hand or third-hand smoking, meaning if you live with somebody uh, who smokes, remember there's smoke also in the hands, right? In the hands, in the, in the clothing. 
you can still smell that. So that's still third hand smoking. Okay. So smoking, second hand smoke, increased age also. Um, there's about um, less than 10% of the COPD patients who have no history of uh, first, second, or third hand smoke uh, still develop COPD because of a genetic abnormality. They have an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Hey, remember alpha-1 antitrypsin we talked about earlier? What is the role of this enzyme again? Two, two right, the protease, right? Two, to stop the protease. But some people don't have this genetically, meaning it's a genetic problem that they cannot produce or they can't produce enough alpha-1 antitrypsin. So yes, they have protease, but then they don't have enough alpha-1 antitrypsin. So the result is the same. It's as if they were smoking. Okay, So same effects. So they have destruction, auto-destruction of their large and small airways as a result. <laughs> Um, it's still smoke, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't have data because, uh, I mean, there are studies now that in marijuana or whatever, tobacco, cigars, mm -hmm. they have the same effects. We don't have enough data for vaping yet. It's fairly new. So there are studies, but studies have to be like a number of years in order to prove it, okay? Um, I mean, America is a capitalist society. Um, I mean, we, we can't stop vaping um, companies from, you know, stopping their production just because, you know, we think we have to prove it, right? You have to go to court, right? Just like anybody else to, to, to stop them, right? I mean, even today, can we stop uh, tobacco? Even if we have the Surgeon General warning now, it causes... Again, it's a capitalist uh, society, so people are free. They know that, that smoking is going to cause COPD, but it's their choice now. Okay, that hey, I wanna, I wanna, you know, but, no. right? Okay. Yeah, a lot of people in my neighborhood, too, usually young kids, they gather in a in a in a vehicle. Then they go in and out, you know, and then the vehicle is just filled with smoke. Yeah. I mean, they have fun, but it's not so fun later. <laughs> okay, so again, a, a small number, no, it's actually not even 10%. Only 2% okay. of people with COPD have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Okay, so it's a small um, population. So in case you see them, I, I've seen a few, probably two or three, that have no history of smoking, but yet they have COPD, they have emphysema. So the doctors diagnosed them with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. They did a test and they confirmed it. Are there um, any lifestyle factors that can that some people are they cannot produce the alpha-1, right? Um, is there anything like medication that... Uh, yeah, right here. It's mentioned here. I mean, I'm not testing it, but here, there's a alpha protease inhibitor replacement therapy. Yeah, they, they can take this, but it sounds expensive, yeah? Yeah, because it is. Okay, manifestations. Now, because this is chronic, so just like in heart failure, Remember when we studied heart failure, we had expected versus, un, I mean, um, because heart failure can have flare-ups, yeah? They can have acute episodes. So same exact here. So there are day-to-day -day manifestations which are expected. Of course, these are not normal. These are expected in COPD patients, but there will be also manifestations that indicate an acute flare-up, an acute exacerbation. It's not written in a table or a chart though. So you're gonna have to pick it out from the paragraphs. So when you do your notes, you'll have to put them in two columns. What are the expected manifestations and what are the signs and symptoms of an exacerbation? Okay. For instance, the chronic cough, this is expected. 
increase sputum production. That's expected. However, the sputum color of yellow, brown, orange, green, are, are those expected? No. No. Okay. So clear white sputum, yes, that's expected. But anything colorful, are those expected? No. So you put that on the other column. That's now a exacerbation, meaning that indicates usually an infection, right? Patient has now a uh, an infectious process going on. Because are these people at risk for infections? Yes, because of the increased mucus, right? The increased mucus will trap even more organisms. Okay, And then is it easy again for them to expectorate these? Yeah, eventually, no, it's very hard. Can you choose to eat and or, or breathe? Can you choose like between breathing and eating? What do you want to do? Hmm. Um, I think I'll go with eating. Okay, you can't, right? So you have to breathe. You can't breathe, you can't eat, right? So are, is weight loss going to be expected here? Yeah. If they lose weight, that does that mean that their management is good? No. No. So we have to do some, yeah, the doctor has to make changes to their therapy just to allow them to breathe better so that they can eat more and longer. All right? How about the barrel chest? You know, the increased anterior posterior di diameter. Is that acute or chronic? Chronic. Okay. So basically to, to identify whether a symptom is um, expected versus exacerbation is, is it acute or is it chronic? So if something is acute, is that an exacerbation? Yeah, that, that yes. Would, that would just yeah. Normal. If it's that chronic, is that an exacerbation? No, because it's, is it going to go away? No, it's not going to go away. That'll be there forever, right? If it's yeah, chronic. Yeah. So the mucus production, it will be there. The barrel chest, it's going to be there forever, right? Yeah, oh. clubbing of the fingers. Is that acute or chronic? Okay. So is that exacerbation or expected? Yeah. That's That's expected. Are the toes, do they become clubbed as well or just the fingers? Um, I, I've seen toes. They probably will call also because if the fingers club, I mean, the toes are even more or even farther than the yeah. fingers. So, yes, there will be also. So, here's the difference okay, in the chest structure. He's even aged. And then they have this posture. They, they We call this the tripod position. So they lean forward uh, with their hands on their knees or on the table okay, so to breathe better. How do we make a diagnosis of COPD? The doctor will have to do a pulmonary function study or pulmonary function test. They will use spirometry. Now, do not mistake this for incentive spirometer. The incentive spirometer is the device, right, that you breathe into. Do you know how to use that thing? What do we do with that again? Do we inhale? Do, correct. Do we inhale? Do we inhale fast or slow? It's either fast or slow. Slow. Slow as in like you're yawning into it. So you put, you ask the patient to, okay, and exhale first and then put the mouthpiece into your mouth and then slowly inhale, slowly inhale like you're yawning. Up and then exhale normally. Okay, and then how often do we do it? 10 times every Every hour, okay? every waking hour. So 10 times every waking hour. So that's about every how many minutes? Every six minutes. Okay. Never tell them to do it consecutively. Just try it. Try what I just did. 
So inhale slowly and deep for up to 10 seconds. Go, try it. Nobody's doing it. <laughs> How did you feel after that? Lightheaded, right? So imagine if you're doing it consecutively, the patient is going to be on the floor, right? So therefore, do it only once every six minutes. So 10 times an hour, all right? Don't embarrass me, please, in clinical, wherein, because I see some students teaching the patient, and I see the patient, okay, can you show me how to use it? And the patient's doing this. <laughs> who taught you? Who taught you to do this? Oh, your student, like Emily. Okay, thank you. Let me talk to her. Right. Now, this spirometer, spirometer, the spirometry, uh, let me show you the machine. One every six minutes. Yeah, 10 times every hour. 10 times an hour. Okay, so this is a spirometer. Okay, so it's, it's a machine. Not necessarily, not necessarily this big. I mean, these, uh, the machine is just this device right here. So this is the reading now. So the patient's uh, doctor will... Um, so this is only in the clinic. You won't see this in the hospital unless the clinic is in the hospital, okay? So this is it. So that's how it looks. Patient will be asked to do a few maneuvers. So the doctor will instruct them, okay, exhale normally, put it in your mouthpiece and then blow, okay? So they'll blow into the, the mouthpiece and it will record a few readings. So what are we recording? What are we measuring? Okay, the following. So we will, one of the tests, being done is FEV1, which is force expiratory volume in one second, meaning the device will measure how much, how many liters of air can you forcefully blow in one second. So if this number goes down and down, then that will they will able, be able to stage your COPD. How bad is your COPD? Because technically this is measuring what the strength of your lungs. Okay, how strong or how, how weak is your lung? So here's the gold classification. Remember heart failure? We had class one, class two, class three, class four, right? Heart failure, uh, NYHA. So uh, COPD also has gold classification. Okay, it's, so it's grade one, two, three, and four are also called gold. Gold one, two, three, or four. Look at the FEV1. So this one, if it's grade one, less than 70%, grade two, um, no, sorry, grade grade one is uh, greater than or equal to uh, 80%, and then it goes down from there, 50 to 79, 30 to 49, less than 30% for grade four. If it's less than 30%, only a third of your lung function is left. What does this patient look like? Can they walk around like you and me in the city, ride a train? No. These patients are bed bound. They cannot do squat. Okay? They're, the slightest movement okay, causes extreme shortness of breath for these patients. So you still want to smoke? So if you do smoke, uh, you know, think about quitting. Okay? There are many ways to quit. Okay? So it's not easy. I've seen my father... My father um, had his stroke because this, of course, will cause cardiac problems too, right? So atherosclerosis. So he had his first stroke because he had heart problems. He was a smoker. When I was in first grade, I remember he couldn't work anymore. So he had to come home. He was forced to retire at 60 years old. He didn't die until 81. So from 60 to 81, I saw him suffer with the cardiac and respiratory symptoms. Like talk about mucus 23 hours a day. He couldn't sleep because he has middle of the night, he has to get up and expectorate all the mucus. Okay, so he'll get a few, you know, one or two hours of sleep, get up again and expectorate. Okay. Plus he had heart failure. So you have, you're talking about diuretics also. You know. 
Uh, plus he had movement problems already because he had a stroke. Okay, so he had some um, residual weakness. All right, complications. We talk about number one is the heart failure. Okay, the patient will have, what do we call that right side heart failure again? Or pulmonale. Okay, so that's uh, one of the major complications uh, among others. So the patient has bad airways, bad lungs, increased mucus production. So will they be at risk for flu? And only the flu or upper other upper respiratory? Okay, all of those RSVs, whatever um, viruses are in the community. Okay, so you have the rhinovirus. So they're easily going to get them. Okay, so are you going to see them in the hospital only once or uh, once every two years? You'll see them two or more times every year. Guaranteed, you'll see them in the fall and in the winter. Hey, you'll see them, hey, and you'll get to know them, all right? So if you work on a med surge floor and you're in a community hospital, let's say, you know, something small like Queens General, for instance, or, or uh, Wood Hall, for instance, you know, you have patients living in that community, right? So you'll see them frequently. Hey, welcome back. Hey, thanks for keeping me employed, right? Yeah, because without these patients, you won't have... You won't have a job, okay? So these people will keep you employed, right? You won't be called off. You won't be floated because here's they, they're keeping your senses high, okay? So these COPD patients, heart failure patients, diabetics, they're your frequent flyers, right? So thank them, right? Thank you for smoking, okay? I'm kidding, right? Okay, no, of course, yeah. yeah. Of course, you want to, you know, of course, you want them to stop smoking, okay? We don't want to see them, but this is the reality. You'll see them again and again and again. Medical management, the uh, besides oxygen and the medications, the medications are not here. They're under asthma. So let's go to asthma. And I'll come back there. What page was that? 608. Okay, let's go to asthma. Because asthma and COPD are treated with the same. Asthma. Medical management. All right, so here's our drug therapy, page 634. You have two tables. So our drugs basically are divided into Saba and Laba. Remember this from farm? Okay, so Saba are your short-acting uh, bronchodilators. And then we have Laba, long-acting bronchodilating agents. Okay. And for Sabas, we've got different types. Okay, let's go to the table. 20-5, you got albuterol, which is a beta-2 adrenergic agonist. So adrenergic agonist meaning the same as uh, epinephrine, right? So it's a sympathetic, sympathomimetic agent. So increase, so side effects are tachycardia, vasoconstriction. Okay. So these are your rescue medications. So SABAs are used in an emergency. And as already mentioned, these are your side effects. So it's a drug chart. So what are always testable in the drug chart? So same as in TB, what am I going to ask you next Friday, next Thursday? Nursing responsibilities and your teachings, right? Including side effects. Then we've got uh, anticholinergics, <clears throat> epitropium, now, ipatropium is the choice if the patient, let's say, has a cardiac problem, meaning they have tachycardia to begin with, because can they take beta-2 adrenergic agonists? No, because this causes tachycardia. So you can't use albuterol. You can use ipatropium instead. So you can use uh, anticholinergics. Okay. So this causes bronchodilation without the tachycardia. 
And we got steroids. Steroids are not for short acting. Steroids are always for long term therapy. Okay. So these are not used in emergencies. These are used in <clears throat> maintenance. Okay. So these are your lavas now. And of course, side effects, steroids cause what on the blood sugar? What happens to your blood sugar when you're taking any steroid, oral, inhaled, or whatever? Increases your sugar. I won't read the drug chart for you. So that's, we talked about the beta-2 ad adrenergic agonists. We have the anticholinergics. We have the steroids. Okay. So for... The LABA, okay, we have inhaled steroids also. Okay, salmeterol are your LABAs now, non-steroidal LABAs. So number one example is the salmeterol. Now these drugs are now combined. So now you have a steroid as well as a LABA together. Example is Advair. Advair is salmeterol and fluticasone. Fluticasone, obviously, that sounds like a steroid, yeah? As it ends in zone, okay? So fluticasone, that, this one, fluticasone is combined with salmeterol, creating Advair. It, you know, the purple disc? Okay, yeah. so that's Advair. So that's a combination of fluticasone, a steroid, and a LABA, which is salmeterol, okay? So they usually prescribe two puffs twice a day. That's for long-term use, meaning they should never run out of these things. Uh, they take them whether or not they have symptoms. It's actually responsible for, for that condition, meaning that's why you don't have symptoms is because you're taking LABAS, okay? So you're compliant with them. So that's why you're feeling good. Okay, the um, Apple TV quit. Next is to ensure compliance because these patients... Uh, the other drugs here, let's say in leukotriene uh, modifiers, Montelukas, this is once daily. These are tablets. Uh, these have less side effects compared to steroids because leukotriene inhibitors only inhibitor, inhibit leukotriene. Okay? So leukotriene is one of the inflammatory mediators responsible for the symptoms in asthma and COPD, meaning the, um, the airway constriction. Uh, inflammation is caused by this. Um, this is one of those mediators. So if you suppress this, will you have airway inflammation? No. Problem with this is this causes um, depression and suicidal uh, ideations, both for pediatric and adult patients. Go back to COPD. Next is you have to teach the patient. In order to have good compliance, the patient must learn how to use their inhalers correctly. All right. Um, so what do we do with, let's say, if they just comply with the medications and use the inhalers correctly, <clears throat> they'll be fine. They'll stay out of the hospital. But let's say fall season comes, winter comes, they will be exposed to infections and they will have exacerbations. So what do we do with exacerbations? If caught early, do you know how to use a meter dose inhaler? Have you heard of um, uh, 
peak flow meters. What's the difference between a peak flow meter? And a meter dose inhaler. Are they the same? What is a peak flow meter for? What are these things for? What does it do? What does this do? This is not the same as a spirometer because this will only measure peak flow. It only measures one thing, which is peak flow. So what is it? It's simply a diagnostic tool. It's only a diagnostic tool. This is used by COPD and asthma patients to determine whether or not they have an exacerbation. So this is what it looks like. These... So this is a peak flow meter. All right, so how do we use it? First, we establish the patient's peak flow. We cannot establish a peak flow if the patient has symptoms, meaning when they have exacerbation. This is first established usually at an outpatient setting, meaning during a well visit. I repeat, this is established during a well visit. Patient has COPD or asthma. They come to see their doctor. They have no symptoms whatsoever. They feel fine. Doctor gives them a peak flow, then we establish the patient's peak flow at baseline. So what they'll do is blow three to five times as strong as they can, as hard as they can, and then we'll record the highest reading. How many mLs are they blowing? So once we have a range of their peak flow, lowest and highest number, so we will establish, okay, so your peak flow is 400. Remember that number. When they have symptoms, let's say they have a cough, they're having shortness of breath, they're told to, okay, grab your peak flow meter and then measure your peak flow. If the patient's peak flow is less than their baseline, meaning let's say my peak flow is 400. I have symptoms today. This have this cough. I can't catch my breath. I grab my peak flow meter. I blow into it. It's only recording 350 or 300. It's supposed to be 400. Am I having an asthma or COPD attack? Yes, I am. Because the peak flow told me that I'm under my peak flow. Does that make sense? Okay. What if I have symptoms, I have a cough, I'm having shortness of breath. I blow into my peak flow meter and it's recording 400 or 450. Am I having an asthma or COPD attack? I'm reaching 400 or even 450. Am I having an asthma or COPD attack? No. Whatever my symptoms are, whatever's causing it, it's not my asthma, it's not my COPD. Does that make sense? It's something else. Maybe I have a respiratory infection of some sort. Is that clear? So is a peak flow meter useful or not? Yes. Can it keep the patient at home? Potentially. Yes. So we can avoid hospitalizations because as long as they use this, they report to the doctor, the doctor can prescribe a higher dose for a short time okay, to manage their symptoms. If it is a attack, meaning before it gets worse, we manage it early. Does that make sense? So every asthma and COPD patient must have a peak flow meter. Okay. All right, we'll discuss the rest because we're out of time. Um, but the test will only cover up to here. So we did not uh, cover the how to use the uh, inhaler. Okay, so we'll do that for exam two. Okay. Um, just one or two questions on those because it's, it's important that we know how to use but this should have been already uh, covered under fundamentals though because that's where you learn about medications and inhalers right yeah things like that you did that in fundamentals yeah because that would be under 
because that would be under medications. Because under medications, it's inhalers, so you should have been taught already. All right, so we'll put it for exam two.